Well, hello, I'm Wendy Burton. I'm a GP from Brisbane, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Pam Douglas, who's also a GP at Brisbane. And we're gonna to talk today about tongue tie. So Pam, oh my goodness, it's early 2019. Tongue tie has been a thing, is a thing, it's a real thing. Uh, it's been known about for multiple generations. But here we are, it's 2019 and tongue tie. Is it underdiagnosed? Is it overdiagnosed? Are we not recognizing it? Are we calling normal, abnormal, Pam, help? So Pam, for me, uh, the classic would be uh, perhaps reviewing uh, a, a new mother with her baby at perhaps that five to 10 day mark and she's concerned the breasts are hurting there's some pain with the initiation of the breastfeeding she's worried that her baby's not getting enough milk uh, the baby's crying she's not sure about the weight gain and somebody has already placed in her mind that perhaps um, this child has a tongue tie or has out and out said to her that they have a tongue tie when i think tongue tie I think about that membrane of tissue underneath the tongue that attaches the tongue to the floor of the mouth. And I think if that is too thick or too long, then the tongue can't actually move out past the lips. And that it'll tether, it'll start to take a little heart shape, and that that might give problems for sweeping debris off teeth once they've established, not now newborns, um, or might give articulation problems with speech so the sounds where we need to move the tongue out and you know licking ice creams and important things you can't go through life without you being able to lick I ice know, cream. I know. <laughs> so so i am naturally concerned if there is indeed tethering of the tongue that limits its movement in a way that would compromise that child either with breastfeeding with dental care with speech or with the pleasures of life such as licking ice cream how can I look at that child, examine that child, how can I help to know if that child actually has a tongue tie that needs to be fixed or treated? Yes, okay, so I suppose the place to start with this newborn mm -hmm. um, would be um, an oromotor assessment. Okay, um, how do I do that? It's, it's not the place to end, it's okay. the beginning in terms of an assessment. So um, it would be part of your um, newborn check, um, but once you come to the face, you've to the skull looking for asymmetries, the face checking for asymmetries. Um, happy that um, there's no um, abnormalities of the face and the skull. So um, then, um, with parental consent um, and with gloves on your hands, um, you'd commence an oral um, examination. Uh, so I place the baby on a mattress on, on the um, examination couch, so mm -hmm. a nappy change mattress, and I like to examine the baby with the baby facing me, um, so the head's um, away from me and the feet towards me, mm -hmm. and I'll ask um, one of the parents to stand beside um, us, beside the baby, mm -hmm. and actually hold that little one's head um, just over the years, not lifting the head, but just securing the baby's head so that the little one can't move from side to side while I'm doing this check, and possibly a little bit of extension so I can see I have my headlight on. And, uh, and so then um, we can start by lifting up the upper lip. And, uh, and this is where we'll demonstrate to parents that that upper lip is actually very flexible. It invariably is, um, actually. And, uh, and what we'll see is a labial frenulum in all its glorious anatomic diversity. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, it will be um, fine and attached quite high. At other times you'll see the attachment um, may even be right down to um, the edge of the gum or up here to go into the um, um, uh, almost towards the undersurface of the gum but these are actually all normal anatomic diversity of, of, of a um, labial frenulum and the lip 
will always be able to be moved up flexibly um, and you may see a little blanching um, if you wish to look for that it's not actually helpful to look for it but you may see a little blanching because that's inevitably going to happen when you put tissues under tension um, you may even um, look for um, some buccal mucosa folding down from the upper lip onto the upper gum actually there's no real advantage in looking for it because the concept of a buccal tie is um, it, 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 it uh, is not um, uh, a meaningful diagnosis. Um, there'll be again anatomic variations in terms of that mucosa. Um, so then, um, so then you may sweep down to have a look at the inside um, of of the um, cheek. So the buccal mucosa on either side. And I must admit, at this point, I'm checking the gums as well looking for something like thrush or candida just just mm -hmm. doing a, um, a careful check while we're there um, for any infection um, you may also at this point in time um, use a tongue depressor and have a look for um, a cleft palate mm -hmm. um, so checking the palate noting the shape of the palate but again the palate is extraordinarily anatomically diverse and yeah not going to in itself mm -hmm. be a cause of um, nipple pain and breastfeeding failure. Because sometimes is it the high arch palates that are women are told that this is women are certainly problem? told that that they'll see a high arch a high palate yep. mm -hmm. um, associated with a tongue, tongue tie, tie and in fact they'll be told with a recessive chin as well right. and there are theories around anatomic developments there mm -hmm. that are actually um, not useful or based in any mm -hmm. um, real developmental anatomy actually mm -hmm. um, so um, we've we've uh, had a look at the palate mm -hmm. then we may come down to um, run our forefinger the pad of our forefinger along that baby's lower gum to look for the lateralization reflex of the tongue um, and uh, you'll notice that the tongue is following your finger in all sorts of ways. There will be um, perhaps some humping movements of the tongue, a little bit of pulling back, certainly some lateralization. Um, and these um, variations on the surface of the tongue and the ways in which the tongue shapes itself, it's like this muscular hydrostat. Um, so it's capable of quite, you know, the intrinsic muscles of the tongue are capable of extraordinary plasticity but they're not going to tell us um, much about um, the tongue's capacity to move we lift the tongue then um, uh, you know with the two forefingers and have a look at um, the lingual frenulum at that point um, paying attention to its insertion points mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, again, the lingual frenulum, as you'd expect, is extraordinarily anatomically diverse. Right. And uh, you may even feel as though you're not seeing much of a frenulum. Mm -hmm. um, it may be quite um, flat mm -hmm. with the dorsal surface of the tongue. Right. Um, or you may see variations of an anterior membrane that run mm -hmm. under the tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I use a variation of the Griffiths classification system. I'll just say 25% um, um, anterior membrane, referring to the approximate distance it attaches along underneath the tongue, or 50% anterior membrane. So a 25% would be that from the base of the tongue to the tip of the tongue, the first 25% That's it. is attached, or That's the first 50%. Yeah. Is there a point there? Is there a number? Can I have a number, please, Pam? <laughs> At which case I say, oh, that one needs to be snipped or that one doesn't? Or is it way more complicated than that? It is really um, more complicated than that. I think, look, I think the truth is if we have a 100% membrane or something close to mm -hmm. the tip of the tongue, yes, um, it's a simple matter to perform a scissors phrenotomy. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll see that I want to um, talk to you about um, tongue function and how we can't make sense of tongue um, structure without really looking at tongue functionality. Mm -hmm. So can I go back to the lingual yes, frenulum? Please do. Um, mm -hmm. 
because the truth is that these anterior um, membranes are really very common um, and, uh, and not impacting on the function of the tongue at all. Um, and it's possible to have an anterior membrane that is extending, you know, really 70%, 80% and to have this wonderful, stretchy, excellent tongue mobility. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't call this a tongue tie because the tongue isn't being tied by this tissue. Is there any way in that examination on the couch I can demonstrate that the tongue is tied or is that, in, in interfering with breastfeeding, or is that an observation of the feed itself? It's going to be um, a clinical judgment mm -hmm. that's made out of multiple okay. um, observations in mm -hmm. your clinical examination. Mm -hmm. And this is how we function as GPs mm -hmm. and indeed clinicians more mm -hmm. broadly all the time. Sure, sure. We th synthesize mm -hmm. multiple pieces of information um, to then offer a recommendation to our parents. Uh, so in fact the search for um, a simplistic solution here. I want a simple. I want a, a simple. A number. It's it's actually not the way um, uh, we work as wise clinicians. Um, okay. We really need to be looking at multiple pieces of information. We need so, sort of medicine. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. want to continue on with my assessment. Sorry. Okay. Please <laughs> and, and, um, and so um, we've we've had a good look at that lingual frenulum. Um, we might also, um, at that point, um, insert our gloved finger, perhaps the little finger um, or the forefinger, gently place that pad up um, against the hard palate and feel the little ones suck. And sometimes I'll even draw the lower lip down and have a look at what the tongue is doing mm -hmm. as that little one is sucking. But, you know, the truth is that very often our babies don't wish to perform in that way they don't like <laughs> to suck on a glove and um, what happens when there's a finger in a baby's mouth is entirely different to what happens when that baby's breastfeeding mm. so again although these are indicative and it's worth doing this oromotor assessment in fact one of the great the great um, contributions of, of this uh, focus on oral connective tissues has been the raised awareness around the importance of doing an oromotor mm -hmm. assessment. Um, but we have to understand that all of this can only make sense in context of multiple other pieces of information. Um, I didn't mention, but you'd also just note um, the shape of that little baby's chin mm -hmm. as well. Now you'll see that this is a kind of working clinician's oromotor assessment. In fact, um, uh, our clinical breastfeeding support people are being asked to use a whole range of uh, oromotor assessment tools, none of which I would argue um, are particularly helpful beyond this kind of pragmatic, um, a professional but, but um, uh, uh, I guess what I'm wanting to say is that it's pragmatic and it's going to give us some useful information. A lot of the, the, the kind of details in an oromotor assessment that breastfeeding support professionals are being asked to do at the moment are actually not useful and will just heighten anxiety for both that professional and for the family. Mm -hmm. um, so there's our oromotor assessment. Okay, so we've done um, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, um, this is where we do need to move to a breastfeeding assessment. Mm -hmm. 